turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, please. We will finish this chapter. And then next week, skip ahead a few chapters, because we've done uh, 21, which was the triumphal entry and Palm Sunday. And I don't remember if we did all these parables and stuff, but anyway, we will skip that. Because we did it. All right, so this uh, passage today, Jesus does some teaching and uh, illustrates his servant leadership. Now, servant leadership is a servant, is a kind of leadership that is not, I mean, I'm sure the term's thrown around, but if you look at leadership in the world today, uh, especially in the United States, that's not what you're looking at. Uh, you're seeing selfish, uh, self-serving, power-hungry uh, type of, of leadership. Uh, servant leadership is just the opposite. Servant leadership is one who leads by examples, who, who leads by serving. And Jesus was the perfect example of that. And so we get to see him as a servant leader in these Three little sections, if you will. And uh, it starts, we'll start at verse 17, but let me pray. Father, thanks for this day and your love and your word. Jesus, thank you for your perfect, beautiful example of servant leadership, teaching us how to be different than the world. Help us to do that, we pray in your name. Amen. <clears throat> so, if you'll recall, uh, there's been some discussion, and uh, let's see, we go back to even 18, and forgiving uh, of sin, and reconciliation, and getting along, and relationships, and following Jesus, and uh, even, even in that uh, particular thing, the rich young man who comes along and says, hey, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, keep the commandments. It's like, I have, right? We'll give up all your money because that's your true God. He's like, oh, can't do that. And then Peter, uh, in verse 27 and 19, said, See, we've left everything and follow you. What then will we have? That was kind of selfish. And so Jesus then told the parable about the laborers in the vineyard, saying that, you know, God's grace is abundant and uh, available to all. But now we have a scene change because it says in verse 17, and as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and on the way said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. Um, that's the, uh, the third time and the final time because he didn't have to say it anymore because it happens after this. But the third time that he told the disciples, and uh, if you've read the, the Gospels and you, you know the story, then this is exactly what happens. He, being the Son of Man, is uh, arrested by a temple guard in the Garden of Gethsemane and taken to the chief priests and scribes, and they condemn him as a blasphemer, and people give false testimony about him. And, uh, finally, they say that he would destroy the temple and rebuild it on the third day. And, uh, and uh, when asked directly, you know, if you're, say, if you're the Son of Man, the Messiah, he's like, you know, yeah, basically. So they can't kill him uh, because of Roman law, so they deliver him over to the Gentiles, which are the Romans, Pontius Pilate being the governor of the area at that time. And he finds no fault in him, but he can't not kill him, because if he doesn't, then there's going to be a riot, and if there's a riot, then he looks bad, and lots of people get killed. Um, and so he delivers him uh, over, and he was, by the soldiers, mocked. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They flogged him, um, which was a brutal type of whipping. The whip had, you know, little bits of bone and metal, so it wasn't just a, a lash on the back. It was a, a bite in and a ripping of flesh off of his back. And 
that was to ensure that when he was crucified, which was a most brutal form of execution, that he actually died. Because some people survived being crucified. Uh, but they wanted to make sure that uh, he would be good and dead, so they flogged him, crucified him, and then, of course, buried him. And on the third day, he ra rose from the dead. But as he says this to his disciples, he's surely preparing them for what's to come, and yet they still can't understand it. They still have in their mind that he's going to be the Messiah ben David, the Messiah son of David, who's going to raise an army and overthrow the Romans, not be killed by them. But that is the first uh, example of his servant leadership, his atoning death. I mean, he, he could have come in power and glory. He could have wiped out all evil on the world at, at that time. He could have done all these things, but he came as what is prophesied, 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 in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, where he would suffer and take the sins of the world upon him and, and therefore fulfill the law in being the payment, the perfect atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world, you know, and, and you get, you know, some of these disciples, at least two of them, Philip and Andrew, they were with John the Baptist when, when Jesus first showed up and John's like, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They're Jews. They know that to pay for sin, you have to sacrifice a lamb. They, they know that there's going to be a sacrifice. And so they had to have known in the back of their head, somehow this was something was going to happen. Um, but you just don't want to accept it. But Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He paid the price for sin. And in doing so, exemplified servant leadership because there's nothing that we could do for him. We can't pay him back. We can't do anything to deserve or earn what he did for us. And that's you know, one of the signs of servant leadership is that you, you do serve somebody who cannot serve you back in return. Uh, when I was a kid, a baby, an infant, toddler, I guess, would be the correct aged terminology, um, I, was, I was late in speaking, and, and I'm making up for it now, I guess. But I was late in speaking because I had two older sisters. And if you have older sisters, you know what that's like, right? Um, so I didn't have to say anything. I'd go in the kitchen and they'd say, Mom, Michael wants a cup of milk. Mom, Michael wants this. Michael wants that. They spoke for me. I didn't have to speak. I was an early start to my benevolent dictatorship <laughs> where I controlled them. No, I just didn't have to do anything because they did everything for me. Um, and obviously, you know, a little two-year-old can't do things in return for his seven-year-old sister or four or five-year-old sister either. Um, but finally, you know, mom said, well, if Michael wants something, Michael can ask for it. And that's when I learned to talk. And I'm sure she regrets those words now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, you know, that servant leadership of doing something for people that, that can't uh, do something in return for you. And we just, we don't see that nowadays. And, of course, part of it's difficult in that we're an independent type of people. Uh, we don't want to admit that we need help. We don't want to take help. Um, but, again, the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus described it, is so different than the world when you think about, you know, the Beatitudes and, and that kind of brokenness, humility, um, really deep down felt need is what it takes to enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to be broken to the point where you recognize that you need help and you ask for it. And Jesus, through his atoning death, gave us that help. So we can't die for the world, but we can die to ourselves. And that's what we're truly supposed to do, uh, to become selfless. Um, and we do that knowing that we've been bought with the blood of Jesus, that we have him to thank for it, him as our example of it, um, and him giving us the power to do it. So we don't suffer uh, what Jesus suffered, that painful flogging and crucifixion and beating that he did, but we can get a little uncomfortable, step out of our comfort zone to help others if it helps them to know Jesus. And that's the point of Christian servant leadership that we serve others as a way to lead them into a relationship with Jesus. 
So after Jesus foretells his death the third time, uh, there's, there's not really a transition, it just says then, right? So not a change of scene, so it's almost immediately after. <clears throat> In verse 20, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, Salome, came up to him, and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, the sons of thunder, uh, came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something, and he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. It's a good Jewish mother. If my son can't be a doctor or a lawyer, then he's going to sit at the right and left hand of the Messiah. Ah, sorry, my apologies if that was insensitive. But So mom wants uh, her sons to be advanced in the kingdom. In verse 22, Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And that means, are you able to suffer the pain and death that I am about to suffer? They said to him, We are able. He said, to him, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been pre prepared by my Father. Um, so this is all, you know, when you know history foreshadowing, uh, James, the son of Zebedee, was the first of the twelve to be martyred. And uh, he was martyred, I think, by Herod. It's in the book of Acts, um, when, when Herod begins a persecution of the church. Um, so he uh, was the first one to die. John took a lot longer. He, tradition has it. He was boiled in oil, but that didn't take... Um, and so then he was uh, exiled to the island of Patmos where he wrote down the revelation of Jesus. Uh, so he took a while, but he did suffer. Both of them suffered greatly for their faith in Jesus. But they're still expecting, you know, even though it's like Jesus just said, I'm going to be flogged and crucified, they're still expecting. But after that, right, something's going to happen. Or maybe before that, or maybe that's not true, we don't want to hear that, but we want to be in seats of power and authority when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, well, that's not mine to choose, it's the Father's. Um, then in verse 24, when the ten heard it, the other ten apostles, they were indignant at the two brothers. Uh, are they mad that they asked for that? Are they mad that they didn't think of it first? Um, are they upset that, hey, Jesus just said he's going to die and you guys are trying to seek, seek power in the kingdom? I don't know, but they're obviously upset. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. There again is the uh, example of servant leadership. He had every right, every everything to come and demand service, to be served. He would be worthy of it. Uh, it would be a righteous rule. Um, Yet that's not why he came the first time, but he came to be a servant leader and to sacrifice his life. And so, you know, he, he says there, uh, you know, the rulers, the Gentiles do this, and it's still that way, right? I mean, think about corporations whose workers get paid minimum wage. How much does the CEO make? It's not minimum wage. Um, that whole structure of uh, the person highest up having power and authority, I mean, in some ways it's necessary, but it's not to be lorded over people, and yet that's exactly what they did then in the first century, and they still do today. And I love that verse, first part of verse 26, it shall not be so among you. I mean, he just said, taught about, you know, the first will be last, last will be first. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to be like this child, to be least. So he says, look, I came as this example, 
to serve, not to be served. And then he shows exactly what he means. As they went out of Jericho, verse 29, as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Um, in another gospel, he only tells about the one blind man yelling it out. But those little differences are all part of eyewitness accounts. You see things differently, remember things differently, record things differently. Um, whether there was one or two, there was certainly blind men or man yelling, Son, help us, have mercy on us, Son of David. Which upset the crowd because they were, again, expecting to usher him in to make him a king. So verse 31, the crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But all the more, or they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, Son of David. And stopping, Jesus called to them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Uh, an interesting study if you ever want to do it, look at uh, all the different ways that Jesus healed blind people and then ask yourself why he did it those different ways. But that's a side note. The point being here that here's these two overlooked people, people on the side of the road, beggars because they're blind, they can't work. Um, most of the time unnoticed. I mean, how many of you ever, we were just down in Sioux Falls, what was the last weekend? Um, and, you know, I notice things because I'm a trained observer. Um, and yet, we walk past them, right? You, you don't make eye contact. That's kind of the social contract in big cities, though. You don't make eye contact or talk to people. You, you know that they're there and they know that you're there. You just choose to ignore people. Um, so it's fun. I've done that in... Uh, Vancouver, Canada, Canada, those Canadians, they're very much like that. They very much walk with their head down so they don't make eye contact. And we were sitting at a coffee shop and the window was open and someone's walking by. I'm like, hi, how you doing? <laughs> oh, uh, hey, good, thanks. You know, <laughs> it's just funny to make contact with people that don't want to be contacted. But um, there are a lot of people out there, homeless people, uh, street people, mentally ill, etc., that uh, we don't want to notice, that we just kind of brush aside or ignore. And yet Jesus shows us the example by noticing the unnoticeable. Here's his illustration. I came to serve and not be served. And look, here's two guys calling out for help. So let me stop. Even though I'm on a mission, i got to go up to Jerusalem and do these things, I'm going to stop and help these guys. And, and what he does, he doesn't, I mean, you would think that a blind person, the first thing they're going to ask is, open my eyes, let me see. Um, but he does ask, what do you want? I mean, they're like, well, Lord, we're hungry today. We haven't got anything because all these crowds are ignoring us. So if you just give us a meal, that'd be great. Uh, so many times I think the church and, and other people see what we perceive as the need of someone else. And we want to meet that need and not necessarily the need that they actually have. So meet the needs you can and are wanted uh, as Jesus did. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, open our eyes. All right can do that. I think that, you know, the other thing is in John, um, I think about that guy that sat by the well for so many years. So many years. The, the pool of Bethesda, Bethesda, sorry, Bethesda. Um, you know, he'd been a cripple, couldn't walk, and he'd been there so many years and tried to get in the water to be healed and healed. And what does Jesus do? Do you want to be healed? and just go up and heal. I mean, that's a complete life change. He'd been crippled for all of his life, most of his life. And, and it's like, you know, do you want to be healed? You, you're established, you're in this life now where, you know, you're, you're used to things. It may be awful, but you're used to it. If I heal you, it's going to change radically. You're going to have to get up and work. Do you want to be healed? So Jesus helped people as... They asked as they needed, not as he saw or knew. I mean, he knew of everything, certainly. <clears throat> and in pity, Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Quite a miracle. 
So Jesus' countercultural life purpose of putting others first, that is not uh, the cultural thing at all, is it? Uh, in this world, do unto others before they do unto you. That's the golden rule. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You've probably heard that. And if you want to get, in head a lot, get ahead in life, right? I searched that phrase. Hundreds of articles. Here's eight things you need to do. Five things to change. Fourteen things to get ahead in life. Tons of them started flipping through. Uh, some of them. Um, some of them had pretty good advice, but they, they're all about you things you can change, things you can do. Um, none of them said, give your life to Jesus, because that's the best thing that it's going to be. <clears throat> but they were good advice for this life. And if you ever go to a bookstore and look at, you know, look at the uh, nonfiction section, you know what the biggest section in nonfiction is most of the time? Self-help. <sighs> We're talking, though, about the kingdom of heaven here. It's the everlasting kingdom of peace ruled by King Jesus. There's no getting ahead because everybody's happy and satisfied to be in his presence. And so who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus, because he's the king. He said his purpose was to serve and to sacrifice his life for many. That's not only countercultural for the first century, it's countercultural today. Uh, most people will not sacrifice their life. In fact, even Jesus said that. You know, some might give up their life for a good man, but not just for any person. And yet he did, anyone who would come to him. It's an option available. doesn't matter how bad you are, how good you are. Jesus gave up his life to pay for sins. So this type of selflessness, it's an outward focus. It is counter-cultural. Most people are set on me, me, me. And, you know, as much conflict as there is in the world, we just have this discussion. It's like you can't even, um, what was it? It was about green energy or something like that. Someone posted uh, a picture of, of a land destroyed, wasted from the mining for materials to make electric cars. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's wasteland. It's just destroyed. And people are like... Fossil fuels are better because they don't do this to the land. How can you drive a fossil fuel car? You're killing the environment. It's like, well, you're, you know, they, they each have their position and they're so entrenched that they can't think of a middle ground. Like, I'm not going to give up my electric car because I don't want to use fossil fuels. Why don't you both give up your cars, live closer to where you work, bike to work, so then you're not doing either one of these things. They can't find that middle ground because we're so divided. So much conflict, no one's willing to be selfless and give up things. And this even, unfortunately, happens in churches where people have opinions about what, the way things should be and traditions. We have as many traditions in the American church as the Pharisees had in the first century. And, and people are willing to fight over those things. And it's just kind of ridiculous. But as Christians, we are supposed to be servant leaders. We know what everyone needs. Do you know what everyone needs? <coughs> Thank you. Everyone needs Jesus. We need a saving relationship with him. And so as Christians, our life is not our own. It's been bought with a price. Just as Jesus gave the life he lived on earth, so we are to sacrifice for the kingdom by living a life of selfless service that's countercultural to this world that worships self and prosperity. And our leadership style is to be servant leadership, serve others, to lead them, to Jesus, which means putting others first when it comes to the kingdom, but not being taken advantage of. And that's a little challenging and a whole lot more to talk about than we have today. So, <clears throat> to wrap this up then, oh yes, uh, the other little point there that's in your bulletin too, let people know you care, because until then they don't care how much you know. So you may know that they need Jesus, but they don't care that you know that until they know that you care about them. Final thought, we can live as Jesus did, being servant leaders in the kingdom of heaven by loving others and leading them to Jesus. And he gave us the example here in Matthew chapter 20. So let's work on that. Gracious and loving God, we do thank you. 
Thank you for your love for us to send your son to die for us in our place for our sins on the cross, Lord. And I pray that there will be more people who can see our lives that have been changed by the gospel of Jesus, that recognize their need for change, that become broken, sorrowful, that weep and mourn over their sin, that seek for a solution to it and turn towards the only answer that there is. Jesus and his death on the cross and his glorious resurrection. So help us, Lord, to see needs and meet them. Share the love of Jesus as he shared his love with the world, recorded by Matthew and others. Help us to be servant leaders. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.